Well, good evening, listeners. You're listening to Lament of Hope uh, podcast, and I'm your host, Danielle Richardson. And I am very excited today. It's kind of a, a special treat for me because I'm such a fan of um, TV shows from like the 1970s and the 1980s. I guess I'm an old soul in that way. I really don't watch a lot of new TV shows. I just like all the old ones. Um, but a TV show I enjoyed was All in the Family as well as Maud. And my um, guest today is actually Adrienne Barbeau. And she played uh, Carol Trainer on Maud, the daughter of Maud. Um, and she's here with me today. But I mean, she's done so many things. She's been in musicals and uh, plays. She's been in films, television shows. She's undone voice work. Um, and so it's really just neat to get to meet her and get to hear about her career, but also just her personal life and things that are important to her, um, especially as she's just lived such a large span so far. Um, you know, Adrian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, I kind of want to start out, you know, you, you've been in, when I was looking at all the things you've been in, I mean, television, musicals, I mean, uh, voice work. Do you have a particular favorite genre that you find like the most, either the easiest or one you enjoy the best? Like, do you prefer television over movies? Do you like being in person plays? Do you like voice acting more? What have you come to to like more or more comfortable with? You know, Danielle, it really comes down to the specific project, the specific character. Okay. Um, I started out on stage. I was the original Rizzo in broad the first Broadway for Of Pippin. And the reason I did that is because I got to play Pippin's grandmother, who sings a song upside down, hanging from a trapeze uh, 15 feet in the air and does a whole trapeze act. And um, at my age, you don't get offered those kinds of roles too often. But these days, if I had my brothers, I'd be doing film or television or voice work primarily because I'd rather get up at five in the morning and uh, go sit on a set all day than have to get my energy up to go on stage at eight o'clock at night. That's a sort of a pedestrian reason, but, um, but truly it, become, it, it does come down to whatever the project is. Obviously voice work is the easiest and I do, in addition to my, you know, animation voice work and my uh, commercial voice work. And and um, I haven't done one for a, a while. Well, uh, I do books on tape, but what I do consistently um, every week, it's like my day job when I'm not acting, hmm. is I, I do uh, video describing for the blind, which means um, if you're watching television and you are visually impaired, you put your TV on the SAP channel, and in between the actor's dialogue, you will hear someone describing what is happening on screen. Mm. And uh, if you're watching SEAL Team or SWAT or Evil or a lot of the Nova shows or a, many, 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 many films, um, uh, you'll hear my voice describing what's going on on screen. So you know, something like uh, he turns to her with a furrowed brow, he pulls out the gun or uh, you know, the victim is on the ground bleeding or uh, uh, the camera moves in on such and such. Things that if you're visually impaired, you're not hearing. So you get to hear it with us. Huh. I didn't know you did that. I knew about the video game like voice work you did, but I didn't know about that. That's really interesting. Yeah, video games are fun too, and and animation, of course, and you know, and one of the best parts about that is 
You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to put on a costume. You don't have to get your hair done. Uh, so there are, different, there are different reasons for taking different jobs. Um, when I'm not acting, I'm writing. I'm working on a screenplay right now, but I have five books published. And yes, yeah. So I just, you know, anything that keeps me busy that I love. Do you, I mean... You've done so many things. Do you ever, do you ever kind of sit back and are you ever wondering like, how did I get to do all this stuff? Cause you're doing, I mean, as you said, you're an offer, you're a voice actor, you're an actress, you've actually done stage, you've done musicals. I mean, you've done a lot of things where a lot of people are usually just one genre or two, but you've gotten to do so much stuff. I mean, is that, how does that feel that you've done all of those things? Is that something you're proud of or? I'm very blessed, I think you would say, and I'm very fortunate. Um, I don't know if some people say, you know, you need to be lucky. I don't know. I don't know if luck played a part so much as um, the universe, you know? I mean, I, I did the work. Um, yeah. You know, uh, when I was first starting out, I had only done theater, little, uh, what do they call it, community theater in a, in a, in a town in California. And um, I didn't even know people earned a living as actors, but I figured I'd get my college degree and I could teach acting because I really liked doing it, you know. And then someone said to me, you know, you want to go to New York and, and at least try to make a living out of this. And, oh, OK. And so... I went to New York, but I went to New York with the thought that I was just 19. I had just turned 19. I didn't know anybody there, but I, I thought, well, I'll do this. And if nothing has happened by the time I'm 25, then I'll go back and I'll get my college degree and I'll teach acting. Hmm. But by the time I was 25, I was a union member. I was an actor. I was working full time. And uh, one thing just led to another from that. How do you feel about just the change in cinema over the years? Because I know, you know, some people are, you know, like really happy about the changes in cinema and story development and cinematography and all of these things. And for other people, I know there's kind of like a nostalgia for the past and how things used to be where it was very... Um, like the acting was kind of the primary thing from the movie as opposed to like the music and the cinematography. But now in the current, you know, century we're living in that all those things are now so key. It's not just the actor. So it's the, the music, it's the director, it's all these other people that can get this recognition now and that kind of bring a movie together. Um, for you, like, do you, see positive change as cinema has adapted over the years or is there anything from the time that you were you know heavily in acting that you miss that you think modern cinema doesn't have you know I'm really not the person to answer this question I don't I don't go to the movies very often I watch primarily international television series from Sweden and Denmark and France and Italy and Germany. And um, oh wow, I don't really, I don't, I don't think in those terms. I don't think I don't watch. I, I, I watch. Absolutely. I can't think of a network. Well, I do see these things because I'm voicing them for, you know, I'm audio describing them, but I don't watch much network television. Um, I, I, I really don't even, uh, I never even thought about it. <laughs> I, I, mean, uh, I mean, the one thing I am aware of is there's there's so much more product out there because there's there's so many more outlets, you know, the, the, all the streaming services and everything. But yeah, differences in filmmaking and differences in uh, in the final product, I'm not the person to ask. Do you have a favorite type of story? Like, I know you mentioned you did, you're did. you doing screenwriting right now. Um, what do you think makes a good story? Oh, well, 
logic, <laughs> uh, believable characters, um, uh, and a good story, <laughs> you know, a good, <laughs> a good through line. <laughs> um, I tend to be attracted to, um, oh, espionage and action adventure and spy thrillers and uh, I'm hmm. not big, I'm not big as an audience member on comedy I avoid horror films unless I'm doing them I don't <laughs> like watching them uh you know I, I one of the one of the shows that I that is on right now that I absolutely love. I think it's on Apple TV is slow, slow houses, slow horses, uh, because the acting is just incredible. Um, I am, I am very taken with good acting, you know, oh. uh, but it's hard to, to shine as an actor in bad material. So, um, you know, it, it's always exciting when I come across something where I want to see all eight episodes of it. Or uh, I'm thinking about, I just mentioned to a friend the other day, there was a a Paramount Plus show on maybe three years ago called The Offer mm. with, My with Miles Teller. Uh, it was basically the uh, the story of Al Ruddy producing The Godfather, and it was so well done. It was so fascinating. And then on the other side, I I take that back. I have watched one um, network show, but by the time I watched it, it wasn't on network. <laughs> called Resident Alien, which is not my kind of show. I'm not usually into science fiction, but again, it was so witty and hmm. emotional and engaging and so well acted. So I guess I'm sort of all over the map, but what makes a good story is, well, always logic. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I want I wanted to ask you about that. What do you mean by logic? Like just something that, cause it would be like something magical, not be logical kind of thing. Like if it's a magic kind of movie. No, if you've set up, if you set up the logic for the magic, then oh, I see. Okay. certainly that that's that's wonderful. But you know, if something happens and it's like, oh, Deus ex machina or something, and it's like, are you kidding me? You know, how did they do that? How would they even know that? Because it hasn't been set up. I I, I am very logical, I guess. Um, I'm also attracted to scripts that are that don't have any typos in them you know? <laughs> and that are grammatically correct. And I can't tell you how many times I get a, I get, I get a script and it's like, you know what, if the writer didn't care enough to e at least put this through spell check or through grammar check, I mean, come on, have some respect for your audience. That's, that's a totally different thing. That's it has nothing to do with, artistry well maybe it does have to do with artistry it has nothing to do with talent it has to do with the basics I guess and it just happens to be one of my pet peeves and that happens a lot you said huh it does happen a lot hmm. to the point where it's like I don't want to read this I mean come on this guy doesn't you know learn how to write before you submit something but anyway is the way it's written how you would actually say it, or it's just that they spelled everything you're supposed to say wrong? Um, no, no, I'm just talking about the actual typing of it, the actual, yeah, grammar where the, the verb and the subject don't match or something oh, like that. Oh, okay. You know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you, you know, is there a character you haven't played that you really relate to in either a film or maybe a book or um, television series that you really relate to as a person, but you haven't personally acted it before? 
is there a character that I really relate to? Well, actually, I'm I, the the screenplay I'm writing right now. Um, uh, is is based on a book that I optioned because it is a character I would like to play. Hmm. What kind of character is it? I mean, are you allowed to say or? Well, she's an older woman who is in jeopardy. <laughs> and uh, that, that's all I'm going to say right now. <laughs> like Jeopardy the game show or Jeopardy no, no, in danger? No, she's in, she's in okay. jeopardy for her life. <laughs> Oh, wow. It's intense. So it's going back to like the sabotage mystery thing you were talking about. Yeah. Do you think like your life, do you think has been kind of like that? No, my no. life. I have not been in jeopardy. No, no, I don't believe so. What do you think was the most exciting time of your life? The most exciting time of my life. <sighs> well, I love the 70s, you know, doing Greece, doing Fiddler first, doing Greece, coming out to LA, doing Maud, meeting uh, John Carpenter, who I eventually married, uh, starting on my film career. Um, but um, uh, I don't want to say that was the, the uh, again, that's not something I usually think in terms of, oh, that was the most exciting time of my life. I, it was a, it was a very, I, I, it was a very joyful time. And, yeah. Uh, well, because a lot of new things were happening all at once. Yes. Yeah. My career was just taking off, you know, falling in love. Um the eighties, I had my first child and that, it, that was all wonderful. Did you really enjoy being a mom? Oh, I love being a mom. It's, yeah. it's, it's the driving force in my life. Even today. I love being a mom. I have my old son just turned 40 and I have two 27 year olds. What do you love about it? <laughs> I love them and I love the love I get back from them and I love caring for them and uh, watching them become the people they have become. And um, I can't think of anything I don't love about it. So how about like hard? Is there anything hard about it? Uh, there have been times when it's been hard, when, you know, when they've, you know, yeah. Uh, there's been times when it's been stressful because they might be going through something that, um, you know, I'd like to help them through, but it's something they have to go through on their own. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's been wonderful. It is wonderful. When you were growing up, did you, how was your childhood? Was it similar to how you parented your kids or was it really different? You know, I, I really don't remember much about my childhood until I was about 12 years old. Um, and then my, my, my parents divorced and uh, I, I don't think, I, I don't think I am parenting in the same way. Um, I think I have a lot more, well, my father wasn't, wasn't around a lot. So, uh, you know, uh, they were, my parents were both loving and, um, but I think I probably have a lot more patience and understanding, uh, than maybe my parent, my, I, I experienced from my parents when I was a child. Hmm. Did you have like, a, do you have a memory of your childhood? Maybe, you know, when you said you started remembering things when you were 12, is there something that sticks out to you about it? Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, I, um, I used to spend my summers on my grandparents' grape farm. My mother worked and my father worked, and, and this was before they had separated. And so when school was out, my sister and I, my sister's six years younger than I am, so I went there for the first six years by myself. But my six, sister and I went down to my grandparents' grape farm. They had 20 acres outside of Fresno, California. And we spent the summer on the grape farm, you know, uh, helping my grandmother cook and uh, not really going out into the fields with my grandfather very much because it was always 103 in the summer. But uh, I, I have memories of my, my grandfather coming in at the lunch hour or when it got really hot uh, to watch uh, Hop Along Cassidy and... Um, my grandmother and I used to watch a show called It Could Be You, where they reunited somebody in the audience with somebody from the old country. And of course, my grandparents were from the old country. And so we would sit there and cry. And uh, on the weekends, my re other relatives would come in and we'd have the gathering and um, the women would all be in the kitchen cooking and the men would all be in the living room playing backgammon. And... Um, so I do remember that, uh, and I I spent my days sitting under a water cooler because we didn't have air conditioning, um, listening to Armenian records and and writing. Now this is now by this time I'm I'm eleven or twelve, but I used to write plays and send them to my best friend uh, back in uh, San Jose. Oh. No, I guess. I guess that was San Mateo. We hadn't moved to San Jose yet. Um, you know, <laughs> and I have since had them sent back to me or I've unearthed a couple of them, you know, The Secret Life of Kenny Turner. I think Kenny Turner must have been one of my classmates. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, and reading, reading. I, I uh, from a very young age, I... I found the library and because my father's business uh, had him transferring many times before I finally settled with my mom in San Jose, um, we would always move at the beginning of summer. And so I'd be in a new town for three months with no school, new schoolmates and no, not knowing anybody. And so very early on, I started going to the library and reading uh, The Black Stallion and The Black Stallion Sulky Colt and The Black Stallion Revolts and uh, Son of the Black Stallion and um, The Nancy Drew Mysteries. And um, mm -hmm. there were two other, there was another mystery series too. Oh, The Hardy Boys. I guess I read The Hardy Boys. I'm, I don't quite remember. Uh, I remember reading a book that... Um, Dale Evans had writ written called Angel Unaware about her um, Down syndrome daughter who died when she was three. And it was written as though her daughter was writing it to God, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and talking about her experience on earth. And I just, I feel like the last line of the sentence of the book was, and now, God, may I go and try my root wings. And years and years and years later, I was hosting a talk show in Los Angeles, a television talk show, and we had Dale Evans on. And I was able to tell her how much I had loved her book as a very young girl. So wow. that, was, that was nice. <laughs> well, the fact that you remember that sentence, I don't remember end of sentence books from yesterday. Well, it had a real impact on me. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know? Well, isn't, you know, I'm thinking of that subject matter seems so serious for a kid, but it was really interesting to you. That's so interesting because usually I haven't met too many children who've read like such a serious topic because I mean, that's sad, you know, written about someone who passed away. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't remember much else about it, but it, it was a very uplifting book if I remember correctly. Hmm. Um, but anyway, I, uh, the Black Stallion, I do remember because by the time I was in, I don't know, sixth grade, fifth grade or sixth grade, 
on the on the playground at at uh, on our uh, breaks, um, you know, lunch break and and our recesses. Uh, I was the black stallion, and I had a group of friends who were my who were the other horses, you know. <laughs> So you were really imaginative. I guess I was. I guess I was. I never thought about it like that. But um, at least when it came to the black, well, I mean, I was just imitating what I had read. Did you, were you really close to your grandparents? Um, yeah, I would say so. They didn't speak much English, you know. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I love them both dearly, but it wasn't like we had long conversations. You know, Grandma showed us how to. We made we made Armenian bread, and we made uh, you know we made all the Armenian dishes. And um, I don't remember any specific conversation. We certainly weren't discussing anything personal or deep because. We didn't speak the same language. Hmm. Did your mom or dad speak Armenian? My dad is uh, from Canada, or my dad was born here, but his family was French Canadian from Quebec. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure my must my, my mother must have spoke Armenian. She didn't certainly speak it, you know, in the house with us because uh, there was nobody to speak it to. But. Um, that she did when she was growing up. So these were her parents then that we, you were talking about? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What was your mom like when you think about her? She was a very strong, independent, life-loving, uh, loving individual who was who died when she was 81 years old and she was still working for jobs and taking dance classes and um, going to the theater and uh, um, she 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 loved life she loved her kids uh, but she was very she she was the first she was the first one in her family to marry outside of the Armenian church. Hmm. She, she married what in Armenian is called an Orard, a white man, because my father was not Armenian. And she left home. And she's really, uh, let me think about all the other aunts and uncles. She's the, really the only one who left uh, the Central Valley, who left, you know, who left the Fresno area. Um, so she was, she was independent. She, uh, if I remember this story correctly, and I could be wrong, but she had read, she was very bright. She had registered for college and then found out that her, I don't know if her parents had to take a loan or they couldn't afford it. And so she never went to college. Hmm. But um, she worked all her life. Uh, I, I think her last, uh, for, the, for the longest time, she was um, in the accounting department for the San Jose City School District. Um, yeah, that was my mom. Did you have like, any personal conversations with her as much or not? Because, you know, another thing, too, I've noticed as I've interviewed um, actors and musicians or what have you from, like, the older generation, it wasn't super common to have, like, such emotional conversations with your parents. I think now there's a very big emphasis on connecting emotionally with your children. But back then, that wasn't so much the focus, yeah, no, no, we didn't have, you know, she may have told me what to do. You know, you can't date that guy and you're not wearing makeup until you're sexy, <laughs> whatever like that. But no, there wasn't a lot of uh, touchy-feely. You know? Did you find that hard 
Or is it not till later that you really thought about that? No, she was strict. And, and I mean, you know, we never, we weren't allowed to leave the house on Saturdays until we had, until the entire house was clean. And, um, and, and yeah, I couldn't wear makeup, you know, and uh, she, she had, she had something to say about some of the people I might have wanted to date. Um, <laughs> but um Yeah, she was strict. Yeah. Were you if, you know, if, if 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 something if something really went wrong, she used a wooden coat hanger, you know. Yeah. But how about was, your that was that that was that uh you know, that was that decade. Yeah. How about your dad? My dad was working. My dad uh you know, he was very low key and, um, you know, he, he didn't do much. What's the word? Disciplining. And um, and then when they separated, I was 12 and um, I only saw him every couple of weeks. And then. Uh, and then when I moved to New York, I, you know, I, I didn't see him very often at all. It must have been hard. Um, I didn't think about it at the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. you know, it sounds like you too are very independent. I mean, just even seeing your career, I mean, you've dived into tons of things that were different. And it seemed like you also kind of similarly, like you have a very independent, strong spirit. I do. I think I do. I get it. I, I get it not only from my mother, but from the whole Armenian, all my Armenian relatives. My Aunt Ruby lived to be 101, I think. And uh, she was still, she was still going strong, you know, and uh, all my aunts, my, my Aunt Anna took care of her husband, who was bedridden with Parkinson's, for 10 years and she had her own health problems, but she, she wasn't going to let anybody else take care of him. She took care of him and, um, mm. you know, and, and my grandmother, I mean, she came over from Armenia when she was 15 or she was married when she was 15. She was widowed when my mother was three years old. And then she eventually married the man that I knew as my grandfather, but uh, you know, strong women survivors yeah do you you know mentioning i know you mentioned with your grandparents i mean the fact that the armenian heritage was very rich in that family but then with your mom and your dad obviously there was a difference for you like what you know what does the Ar being armenian mean to you is that something that over the years you've grown to really become attached to or is that something that you know you you know you're armenian but you know, Armenian food, Armenian traditions, Armenian history is not as central to your life as it was for your grandparents? No, it's not as central to my life. Although <laughs> I started my memoir, uh, I think I started my memoir by saying something like, I'm Armenian. I, I, I can't remember what it was, you know, it had to do with my curly hair or whatever. But when I was growing up, nobody even knew what an Armenian was, you know, hmm. uh, it's only been in the last, what, 15 years, 20 years that, I mean, I mean, truly it's probably in my mind, it's, it's probably not since the Kardashians came on the scene that people really do what an Armenian was. And then what they know is not necessarily what I knew of, of Armenians, you know, um, but I am, I am, uh, uh, connected to the heritage, I think, just in terms of the strength and everything. I, I'm not a big Armenian food eater, but then I have very strange eating habits anyway. I, you know, <laughs> so, and, um, and I wasn't raised in a church or anything. So I don't have that kind of a background, but, um, but the suffering that the Armenians went through uh, what do I want to say here
the fact that the Armenians were persecuted, and that is in my memory and in was in my knowledge as a young person, although my family never talked about it. They never talked about the uh, the pogroms or, you know, they never, I had a cousin, a cousin's husband whose mother had escaped. And the story she told was so unbelievable, um, having to set her two-year-old son down in the middle of the desert because she could no longer nurse him because they had no water and they had no food. And she set him down and walked away and never saw him again in the hopes that the Turks would take him in. And then she was uh, kidnapped by the Kurds and forced to work in the opium dens. And she eventually escaped and through the Armenian underground, got to the United States and remarried and then found out that her husband, who she thought had been killed by the Turks, was alive in the States and never got in touch with him because she was terrified she would be deported, I think, because uh, she was a, you know, a bigamist. Uh, I mean, there were those. Oh, wow. But I never Learned those stories until I was in my 30s, you know. So I didn't grow up with stories of, of the uh, Holocaust, um, the genocide, but I was aware of it. And one of the things I always remember thinking was, how can anyone who has experienced what the Armenians have experienced or what any culture has experienced if they've been through a genocide, turn around and persecute any other religion, you know, or any other culture. Uh, because oftentimes I would see even Armenians that I knew, you know, talking down about other cultures. And I think, how can you say that? They're, you know, we're all the same. We're all the same. Uh, we've all, anyway, I'm getting off way off. So let's move on to something else, but <laughs> no, no, that's true. It is. I think it, it really shows that just people in general, were all fallen. You know what I mean? Like just, we're so quick to forget the pain and suffering we've gone through and then are quick to turn around to other people who are suffering and say something wrong. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, what else? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was going to ask, I know, like, obviously, I mean, you didn't go through the Armenian genocide and you heard this, but I mean, you must have gone through hard things in your life. Is there a particular time that you found really hard? Um, my divorce from my first husband was very, very painful. It was not something I wanted. Uh, we have remained good friends and we've raised an incredible son. But um, that was a year of, of depression, because, especially because my child had just been born. And, yeah. and um, that was hard. That was and hard. Was, was it, you said it, I'm, and I'm sorry, I don't know this, maybe I'm supposed to, but was it, you said it wasn't you that wanted it was, how did it happen? Um, my husband just, um, felt that he couldn't stay in the marriage any longer. You know, we, we didn't, maybe we didn't know each other very well when we got married. And, um, as time went on, we both needed other things. Hmm. Was that something you expected or did it come out of the blue for you? No, for me, it came out of the blue. It hmm. came out. Although maybe if I look back on it, I realized how much we were having to compromise to, to, to be together. You know, we like to do different things. We had different personalities. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I loved him dearly and, and uh, that was hard, but you know, um, 
as a friend of mine said, when I when I first said my marriage failed, a friend of mine said, your marriage didn't fail. It, it worked for, you know, seven years or five years, however long it was. And then and then you're going on to something else. So um, and I did. <laughs> and because you married again, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever expect to marry again after that? I didn't. No, I didn't expect to. I was certainly, you know, I, I, it didn't matter. I mean, I wasn't looking to get married again. Um, but uh, somebody asked and it seemed like, yes, this is right. But that too ended in divorce, didn't it? Yes. Uh, we were together for 20 years. And wow. I, and again, we just sort of grew in different directions and we've remained very, very close friends. He, I, I see him like four or five times a week. He comes over and walks the dogs or, <laughs> um, and we have two, two sons together. And so we're always involved in their lives and um, we're very good friends. Was that something mutually you wanted or? It was something that I wanted, I think, more than he did. I just, okay. yeah. Was it hard the second time or was it a little easier? Oh, it was hard. <laughs> it was yeah. hard. I mean, you don't want to cause pain to anybody and certainly didn't want to cause pain to my two children and, and or my husband. But it, we did it. You know, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, you seem from talking with you, I mean, it seems like you have had quite a life that you've experienced so many things. And that's just, I mean, that must be, because I guess for me, you know, I'm young still, not to say that you're old in a mean way, <laughs> but okay. just like. You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, this woman has been through a lot. She has, you must have tough skin. <laughs> well, I'm Armenian. <laughs> That's true. I'm not quite sure. It's just the Armenian, though. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had, I've had a lot of therapy. I've worked on myself a lot. I, uh, I, I have a sort of a I, I don't know maybe a basis in metaphysics I understand that what we have is what we have at the moment and uh, that we can't control anything or anyone and that uh, I try to live as stress-free as I can it's not always easy but um, but I don't try and control everybody else or, you know, I just try to listen and hopefully understand. Um, and only offer advice if I'm asked for it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and stay in the moment because there's nothing we can do about the past and it doesn't, you know, there's no sense in, in berating ourselves or feeling guilty or, uh, you know, I, I sort of think guilt is a man-made emotion. I mean, there's, it's done. There's nothing we can do and there's not much we can do about the future, you know, but yeah. what we have is now. And so I try to, live it with love and and uh and in the moment and um and the only thing i ever really taught my children was treat other people the way you want to be treated do other th do unto others as you would like to be have done to you or whatever when my boys were about three years old we got on an airplane and um <laughs> i wanted them to <laughs> buckle their seat belts and I said, okay, what's the golden rule on the airplane? And they said, treat other people the way you want to be treated. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the rules. 
did they um oh it was right in the tip of my tongue i was thinking oh that's what it was i was gonna say you mentioned earlier not growing up in the church do you have like currently now do you have like a spiritual practice or religious in any way or not really I'm not uh, religious in terms of a a church, right? Uh, you know, I I I don't know. I mean, I have a spiritual life that that I couldn't even explain to anybody else. But you know, I I sort of believe in the universe and in. Uh, uh, it, it's it's almost impossible for me to, <laughs> um, and and just in 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 love in in being loving and um, understanding and you know. But as far as following the rules of a church or believing in sin or believing in you know anything like that, no, I don't. I, I'm not into that. Yeah. Is it where you, did you always feel that way or was there a particular time in your life when you were like, this is what I think and, and it hasn't changed? Um, uh, in the eighties, I, uh, I got involved in, I mean, I, I, I became friends with a, uh, a healer, uh, a, literally a healer, a man who has been shown scientifically to have the ability to alter bacteria with his hands hmm. and, you know, sort of listen to his philosophy, which had to do with, you know, whatever we verbalize, we're putting it out into the universe and that's what comes back. Uh, and um, just, just basic metaphysical concepts, I guess. Um, like the power of words. Pardon me. Oh, like the power of words. Power of words, yeah. The power of affirmations. Um, the power of energy. I mean, you know, putting out good energy. Uh I I really couldn't explain it to anybody. I I, I tend to think because I've had several experiences with people who I thought had a gift for communicating with souls, you know, I tend to think that maybe there is something going on after we die. Uh, but other than that, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think you explained it well. I think it's an honest, I mean, you're, this is what you honestly think. So I think it's, you, you know, you explained it well. Um, do you, is there something, you know, you were talking about the universe. Is there something in nature that you find comforting? I mean, I know personally for me, I mean, I, I struggle with, I have a lot of anxiety. So one thing I find really calming is the sound of water. Um, is there like something in nature that you find really calming or that you really enjoy? I take a shower every morning just because I'm going to get clean, but I take a bath. <laughs> But I take a bath every night in between somewhere around five or six when we hang up <laughs> and and that is my relaxation. Uh, sometimes I'm only in there for 10 minutes. Sometimes it's longer, but I just sort of let everything go. I love being outside in the sun. I, I spend my weekends or my free time, whatever, out in, in my backyard with a book Um I I love being in the mountains. I love being at the beach. I love and I and I am uh I don't take it for granted. I mean, I was sitting out there the other day, lying on my back, reading my book, and I looked up and the tree was all over me and the way the light was and everything. And I thought, I'm gonna take a picture of this and put it on Instagram because this is really nice to be looking at, you know. Yeah. I, I don't take it for granted. I am aware of it. Uh, even when I walk the dogs, sometimes, sometimes I've got my language tapes on and sometimes it's like, no, I just want to listen 
to the sounds. I want to listen to the birds. I want to listen. Okay. So that guy's using a blower on his grass, but (laughs) I just, I want to, I want to be aware of my surroundings. Um, Do you ever find that hard? Because I feel it's hard for me to turn my mind off. So sometimes I notice myself that I I purposefully distract, you know, all these listening to a podcast or listening to someone talking or something. And then when I when I actually listen to nature, I get all these I'll start thinking all these things and they just crowd in. And maybe it's just me and, and anxiety. I don't know. But it's like, it's hard for me to just be still and listen to to nature or listen to what's around me and just focus on that. And by you saying, because for me, it's hard to turn my mind off. You are giving yourself an automa- or a, you know a, a, an auto-suggestion. And so if you could say, in the past, it's been difficult for me to turn my mind off. It's just like when people say, oh, I have trouble remembering names. Well, if you keep putting that out there, your brain's going to say, okay, I have trouble remembering names. Hmm. Okay, you know, in the past, I've had trouble remembering names. And put that away. That's one of the sort of metaphysical philosophies I was talking about. I don't find it hard because I just move my mind. I mean, uh, you know, I'll just, okay. Well, no, I actually, I do more than that. I guess I make an effort. I mean, in the morning, if I have time uh, on the weekends after I've walked the dogs or whatever, if I have time, instead of having breakfast in my dining room or in my living room, I'll go outside and sit. I've got a chair right outside my office on a balcony It's just a chair with a little table next to it. And I'll sit there and have my tea or whatever. Uh, Just even for 10 minutes, just to be sitting in nature. Mm. So you've almost made a discipline of sorts. Well, I take it for granted. It's because I love it. I mean, I, oh, I'd rather be out there than be inside and listen to the TV on or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, So I don't. I never thought about it as a discipline, but it's just the way I am. Well, you know, maybe it's also, I mean, because with your generation, you didn't have Instagram and Facebook and all the social media. That's right. But young people now, I mean, we grew up with that instantly. So I can see how the attention span, you know what I mean? Like something not to constantly be moving in front of you, constantly changing. Um. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, do you have a garden or anything? Oh, I have a a, a huge garden. Uh, Oh, no. Do I garden like in actual planting things and pulling them out and eating them? No. (laughs) I I did years and years and years ago at uh, the house that I lived in while I was doing mod. But I never had time to harvest anything or cook anything because I was always on the road filming or doing, you know, going off to do this movie or do that movie or do that movie. And so, no, I do not. (laughs) I have a beautiful, uh, I have almost an acre where I live and it's very sort of wild. I've got a lot of fruit trees, which I do, you know, I harvest the fruit, (laughs) Um, but I I don't have anything to do with making them grow. Um, And bougainvillea and, and, you know, I've got a wonderful sapota tree which most people don't know it's a it's a south american fruit that is i love nobody else in my family likes eating it um but and it's very prolific is it Um, sweet yes yes it's like a custard banana a banana custard you know and it's the it's the consistency of of a soft custard um they're wonderful they're wonderful. I've got a couple of those. I've got a couple of avocado trees, which I have to fight the squirrels for. I've got pomegranates, which again, I fight, I guess I fight the birds for those. I've got grapefruits, which are great, but I can't eat grapefruit anymore because it gives me, uh, it, it damages my heart, my uh, esophagus. Oh. Um, but, um, but yeah, I do like, I love to go outside and, and just sit there and read. 
That sounds really nice. And you can eat fruit while you're while you're reading. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I'll just ask you one more question. You know, what, you know, in the time that you've lived and the things you've seen and experienced, is there something about the world that if you could change, I know there's many things, so don't be intimidated by the question, but if there was one thing you could change that was in your power to do, what do you think you would pick? I'm not quite sure how to phrase it. It's the opposite of war. Uh, it's the opposite of people being afraid of people who aren't like them. It's the opposite. It's, I guess you'd say universal love and acceptance for everyone. That would solve it all, wouldn't it? It would. It would if people truly did love like that. It's yeah, not, it would. It's not going to happen, but you know, I mean, if 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 Christ, if one religion could accept that there are other religions and that they have a god that is just as valid as their god, and everyone could just get along, how's that? <laughs> yeah, eternal peace and rest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Adrian, this has been delightful. I've loved, you know, getting to talk with you. It's almost felt like I've been sitting on your porch talking to you while you're reading a book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy your bath. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You have a good night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.